Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fighter Heart Podcast, where we talk to people who have gone through extreme adversity and come out on top. I'm Joe Rizzo. I'm Ryan Costello. And our first guest today is Rob Rodriguez. How's it going, Rob? It's going great. Thank you guys for having me. So, Rob, we've had on before. We uh, Not on the podcast, obviously, but uh, we did your interview. So we just want to go a little deeper and uh, give the audience uh, a little more insight to who you are. Absolutely. I'm excited to share. Awesome. Uh, so let's, let's get on a timeline. Um, where'd you grow up and um, go from there? What, what brought you to where you are now? Sure. So originally I grew up in uh, Uniondale, Long Island, uh, but I've moved around a lot as a kid. So uh, just all throughout Long Island, honestly. And then uh, my senior year in high school, I actually moved to Arizona. So I spent a few years out there wow. and uh, ended up making my way back here. Uh, but originally Long Island, born and raised. Um, that's awesome. So you, uh, what, what made you go to Arizona? Uh, actually, so when I was uh, kind of about 15, 16, you know, my parents weren't really together. So, you know, behavior, acting out, uh, you know, in high school and I ended up leaving my high school. I went to Holy Trinity High School and I transferred. My dad moved to Arizona. And I ended up moving down there my last year in high school um, to kind of get away from kind of the New York thing and uh, just trying to start over. <laughs> but doing that in your senior year was pretty tough. I could imagine. So you you were you could explain to the audience you were born without one of your legs. Yes. Uh, so I was born with a birth defect called fibular hemimelia. I only had two toes, no ankle. My mom had to make a really hard decision to amputate my leg when I was 10 months old. She wasn't sure if she was gonna do limb lengthening. Uh, she had a lot of suggestions in regards to you know, doctors on what she could do. But if she didn't decide to amputate, then I would generally be in a wheelchair or have to ambulate with crutches. So she decided amputation was the best route. And now here I am today. So as far back as you can remember, you didn't have, you, you just remembered putting on your- yeah. um, this is it. This is it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't only thing that I remember is what I see in photos. So I don't really remember having my foot I've based to me. I've been in a prosthetic my entire life. Do you feel that that not knowing uh, was an advantage dealing with your circumstance, knowing like this is all, you know, this is the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I help people, you know, on a day to day basis who lose their limbs, you know, in their 50s, their 60s or young kids. And I can say now, because I've spent so many years, over three decades being an amputee, you know, I'm used to it. Um, I've had a lot of trials and tribulations that I've overcome. But so my tougher years were when I was younger. Technology mm -hmm. was different. You know, I didn't, they don't have the, the type of feet um, and components to help make the legs as comfortable as they mm -hmm. do today. So I went through all of those eras and changes and testing of new prosthetic devices and uh, being a guinea pig <laughs> for certain wow. things. And it was tough. It was tough because, you know, I was insecure as a teenager. If you're not missing a limb, you're just trying to fit in and be cool. So I'm um, having a prosthetic. It wasn't easy. And those were my, my tough years and they kind of molded me into the person that I did, am today. Did you like get stuff from, uh like people made fun of you, you're saying? Like, uh, I mean, of course. Like I, I mean, in general, growing up in New York, you know, you got people who are picking at you, uh, you know, constantly calling you names, things of that nature. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I've come from kind of like a tough family and I've always been told to stand up for myself, to keep my head up high. Of course, even if it hurt, you never showed that hurt, kind of always mm -hmm. kept that, that, that straight face. And uh, I've been a fighter my entire life. So I never let that stuff get me down, even though sometimes it does. Is that what inspired you to get into kind of the career that you- Yeah, did that motivate now? you, getting in all that to just- Absolutely. I feel like it's a, it's a double-edged sword. So part of it was like insecurities. So fighting back on my insecurities and making sure that um, I was good enough because a lot of the time I felt like I wasn't. So I used any type of setback or obstacle as motivation uh, to compete as, a, as an athlete, you know, to, to prove people wrong, to show them that I can do it. Although people said that I couldn't do a lot of things. Wow. You said you, you mentioned you were a guinea pig for a lot of different prosthetics. What, are, what it's like something that didn't work and you were like, this is not gonna work. Yeah, so uh, there's so many systems to kind of keep a prosthetic on. You know, there's something called a pin lock system. Um, there's suction, there's vacuum. And so uh, the vacuum system, when they first came out, I wanna say around 2000, there was like a, a big block that you actually put on the side of your prosthetic and you would push the buttons and it would like pull air out basically. And it, so it would suck 
air out as a vacuum and it'll keep your leg on and you will wear a sleeve kind of like the sleeve that I have on now but then you also had to charge it and oh. Oh. so it would die and uh, you know if you didn't charge it every day or two and I didn't like that I, I was one of the first people to test it cyborg yes yes <laughs> and I didn't want to have to charge my leg you know it was just something that I just didn't because it's I still my phone yes I'm yes charging my leg. exactly exactly so I didn't want to do that you know um, also, so like, uh, so they usually mold our limbs so to get your anatomy, you know, your knee and the imprint of your leg so it fits into your socket, uh, they mold it with plaster. But then they came out, I wanna say 98, 99, they came out with a system where they can actually scan your leg and 3D scan it with, uh, with a scanner and then it would show the dimensions on a computer. I was actually like one of the second people in the country to have that done and to then for them to fabricate a prosthetic by doing it that way, uh, which also didn't work out well for me either. I kind of like the hands-on approach. So things like that, um, being able to go through the nuances, give my feedback, uh, and being a part of that technology change has kind of helped me to uh, be a professional in the industry today. Wow, where do you feel the technology is now compared to years ago? Yeah, like, like what are you rocking room now? For growth or? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I'm rocking now is, uh, no, I mean, I work for a prosthetic company, so I'm very fortunate and I've been mm. doing this for a long time. I always joke, you know, when I was a kid playing sports or playing basketball, um, my championship baseball game, my prosthetic foot would break. And I've been on vacation in a different country and my foot is broken and my mom has duct taped my foot. Now, if my foot breaks, I have an extra foot in the car. I just pop this one off, put a new one on and to the, the, it is day and night, you know, um, the kind of foot that I have on now, I feel is an all purpose foot. It's a lot of energy return. Mm -hmm. It allows me to get up and down stairs easily. Um, so I can play basketball, just do whatever I need to do. It's an all purpose foot, you know, but back then we had something called like satch feet, which weren't, didn't have carbon fiber really, which is what my foot is made out of now. Oh, um, yeah, it was a little heavier, you know, if you will, like kind of layman terms, didn't have a lot of spring you know, in it. Uh, so now my everyday foot does and it allows me to do a ton of Is different things. Is it suction or? Which, so which I, so yeah, I use suction now. That's what I, that's what I found that works best for me, but everyone is different. You know, some people mm. might like or dislike something. Um, and that's kind of why they have several different, you know, choices. And I always try to gear people to figure out what's comfortable for them. Nice. So let's bring it back. So we didn't even mention Rob's a USA athlete. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So how did you get into this athletic um, area with having one leg. Yeah, yeah. So I've played able body sports my entire life. Hmm. So playing basketball, baseball, football for one year, football um, with guys like you, you know, two legs, two arms, just trying to compete. Again, proving myself, fighting for spots to make teams, to be one of the best, to be one of the fastest. And that's kind of where my competitor spirit has always grown. I've always wanted to be a professional athlete. Like hmm. that was a dream of mine since I was a kid it to be specifically like a professional basketball player, right? Grew up in that Michael Jordan era. You know, I'm a Knicks fan, unfortunately, trying to move over to the Brooklyn Nets, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but grew up watching the Knicks. And, you know, so it was something I aspired to. And then I transitioned to making music, you know, growing up in this hip hop culture, I started to, to rap, you know, in my teenage years and got away from the sports. But then I found an organization called the Challenge Athletes Foundation. And I went to like one of my first clinics and this one prosthetist came and made me my first running leg. And I realized that there were other people playing sports like me and that there was just a whole new world. Mm -hmm. Then I just started di diving into it. And then I played so many sports, you know, year to date. So, and wow. then ultimately, you know, competing for Team USA in several sports and still trying to work my way up. So did you start off um, with basketball, like very beginning? Yeah, so my first real adaptive sports team was basketball, and we were called AMP1. It was an amputee basketball team where if you're missing a leg, a lot of times they want to put you in a wheelchair to play full court basketball. We actually made a team called Stand Up Amputee Basketball. Where we played four quarters with our prosthetics, just re basically regular basketball. There were no teams for us to compete against because we were a high level of amputees, almost like the 1%, mm -hmm. where you can play 12 minute four quarters, you know, and up and down, up and down, up and down, regular basketball. Yeah. Uh, so we ended up acquiring Nike as a, you know partial sponsorship. We had some wow. prosthetic companies, a partial sponsorship. And what we would do is we would travel around. Uh, we'd done NBA halftimes. We competed against like D1 colleges. And what we would do is we would beat 
guys who had all their limbs. You know, we would go and say like, we can hoop, you know. I always say that, you know, I'm missing my ankle, but I take ankles, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. a good crossover, you know, a good jump shot. Um, so basketball was my first passion and it opened up my eyes um, to doing what I'm doing now because we would also speak to kids before our games and uh, it opened up so many doors being a part of that basketball team. Wow. So now your main thing is running, right? Triathlon. Triathlon. Yes. Triathlon. yes. So what, for people that don't know, what is a triathlon? Yeah, triathlon is swimming, biking, and running. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, they always say three legs uh, to the sport because it's three different sports. And literally I'm kind of showing up with three different prosthetic legs, you know, uh, <laughs> swimming first, getting out the water, you know, jumping into your bike. And then once you're done biking, you know, switching off my leg, getting to my running leg, and then I run. So, Damn. How yeah. long is each? Uh, so there's different. So like this weekend, I'm doing an Olympic uh, distance uh, triathlon on Long Island. Uh, but two days ago, I just got back from Portugal uh, competing for Team USA in Portugal, which was a sprint distance, which was like a 750 meter swim, 12 mile bike and a 5K run. Wow. Uh, the one I'm doing this weekend is a mile swim, 24 mile bike and six mile run. Six mile run. How long is the <laughs> training process to get you up to speed to be yeah, able to do something like that? What's your day to day like? Oh, uh, man, it's a lot. So, like, this morning I worked out for an hour, like, did strength and conditioning, uh, bike for an hour, and uh, ran for 44 minutes and then just swam, like, 2,000 meters. Um, so it just depends. Every day is different. Depends on what my coach kind of assigns. And then I might throw in some extra workouts in there, too. But uh, usually training anywhere from, like, 10 to 15 hours a week. That's awesome. I don't um... Like six miles, I can't even think about. It. <laughs> <laughs> six miles. Do you feel that like does it add more stress on the one leg because of the prosthetic? Or yeah, do you yeah. overcompensate? That's a good question. Yeah, hundred percent. So I've been overcompensating my entire life, you know, because subconsciously, you know, you always want to go to what you're, where you're more stable, which is my sound leg, is was what we call the non-amputated side. So many years of that, I have arthritis on my knee. There was actually a point where doctors, a doctor told me, you know, to stop playing sports. Mm -hmm. You know, at the time I did a Team USA sitting volleyball. I was on the A2 program, the development program. And, you know, I was doing the basketball and I did American Ninja Warrior and was just did para Spartan racing and went to the world championships for that. Just any sport that I could, but my knee, I was overcompensating. Uh, and they told me basically to, to kind of slow down on the sports. And then I got into the one sport that you use one leg, which was amputee soccer. And I ended up making the USA team for amputee soccer. Mm -hmm. If you Google it, we play on forearm crutches. You don't wear your prosthetic. And you're basically just using your sound leg. And it was tough. Uh, a lot of wear and tear uh, on one side. And then that wear and tear, I realized, as, especially as I got older, I'm like, man, I can't keep doing this all the time. And then once COVID hit, that's when I made the transition to, uh, to triathlon. Mm -hmm. And now I've kind of really focused on my balance. Because in triathlon, you got to be pushing out power on both sides of your body. If you're swimming, you know, your right arm and your left arm for your stroke have to be the same. On your bike, the same thing. Um, same thing on the run. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot of work, so try I, to keep it equal. I guess you've always biked your whole life. Uh, like long kind distance of. biking. Yeah, I mean, so I was always like biking with my kids. I didn't bike at this level uh, like I'm biking now. This is a whole different level. And, you know, uh, so I biked with my friends and did like little trails, but this is a whole level swimming of biking. Too. Yes, I was a swimmer, but not competitive swimming. You know, more running. Running is my strong suit, and I did a lot more running. Uh, but I did all three. Just never really put it together like this and not in the sports format. Wow. When did you make the transition from uh, just being an athlete to starting to speak and starting to motivate others that might be going through something similar? Yeah, so being a part of that Ample and Basketball team was uh, a game changer. In 2013, I went on a trip to Indiana. We were playing a basketball game at a church, and you know we beat the, the church team, and our message was to never give up. And we got back to our room after you know winning the game and speaking to the kids at the church, and we got a Facebook message. And it was this young lady, she was 13, her parents just got divorced, and she, her best friend convinced her to come see us at the church. And she told us how she actually had plans to commit suicide that weekend. Mm -hmm and how our message inspired her. Now all the guys on the team have so amazing stories and we would put them all together. And again, we would give you know, our heart to, to, to these people and then show them our talent. And that inspired me 
from that point on, when I got back to New York, I knew that the sports part was amazing, but the speaking, you know, and telling my story and um, helping another kid who may have felt the way that I felt. There were times that I wanted to take my own life, that I felt like I didn't belong. And, you know, I wish I had someone there, even someone who was missing a leg to just kind of give me that confidence. Mm -hmm. So right then and there, I knew that I needed to speak more, I needed to share, um, and just kind of walk into my purpose. And so I started doing that in 2013. I spoke for free for about four years until I ever got like my first check because it started costing a lot of money to travel and gas and I got tickets on my car and I had yeah. to figure out a way to get paid, uh, you know, to make it work, you know, and I had two kids and my wife. So she was like, you know, uh, you know, we, you know, this is great what you're doing, but you know, we also have bills to pay. So yeah, and then, uh, so I made that transition into speaking um, as well as doing sports and mm -hmm. I found my purpose with that. How often do you speak and where all over Yeah, the I speak country? all around the country. Um, I've spoken all around the world, but I speak, uh -huh. you know, all around the country, I speak to companies, uh, corporations, schools, you know, nonprofits. Uh, I have, a, you know, a very lengthy story and um, I can, you know, fit into whatever the category may be and share different parts of my life. Uh, mm -hmm. So I speak all year round. You know, but it does get busier like when schools are out because a lot of schools will invite me, you know, colleges, high schools, elementary schools. Uh, but I speak to companies and corporations all year round. Wow. And your main message is never give up, right? Anything's possible. So that's my, uh, my message is I anything's possible. You, know? <laughs> you say that all the time. <laughs> yeah, man. That's, I mean, because yeah. it's true. It's true. I mean, I don't come from much. You know, I was a you know, victim of abuse, a victim of a house fire, and missing my leg. You know, I didn't have a silver spoon. I've literally had to fight for everything that I've had. I uh, manifested my entire life and you know anybody who knows me knows that I, I work really hard I'm, I'm non-stop uh, so I truly believe that anything's possible if you you know you put your mind to it that's awesome man I you mentioned a house fire what happened yes sir so when I was young uh, so my two days before excuse me four days before Christmas my house burned down uh, my mom woke me up she told me the house was on fire she basically brought me outside I hopped to my neighbor and asked her where she was going she was like, I'm going back in the house to get your prosthetic leg. You know, the legs are expensive. And at that time, we didn't have a lot of money. So she went back in, got my leg. My aunt, she was stuck on the second floor and she had to jump out of the window. She suffered third degree burns all over her body. She still has them now. And my grandmother was trapped in that fire, so she passed away, which uh, caused me to move around a lot. Again, my dad was in and out of my life. So, you know, my mom and my aunt both picked up two jobs so that they can provide for me and I kind of bounced around a lot. That's why I moved all around <laughs> Long Island uh, while they were trying to kind of provide and give me you know, some type of stability. And you know, so that was one of my earliest memories and it changed my life. Dude, you're a fighter heart. That's it, man, <laughs> fighter heart for real. You just keep moving forward. That's it. So you mentioned before you have like a day job too, right? Yes, sir, yes, sir. So I work for a prosthetic company and I cover eight offices here in New York. So I help vascular surgeons, uh, I do in-services to um, help with amputation, suggestion uh, to help patients recover uh, so that this way they can get into a prosthetic, they can walk again. Uh, some of these patients, I help them get jobs and just achieve some of their goals. You know, I had a patient who just wanted to walk his daughter down the aisle in six months. So, you know, we helped him do that. You know, everyone is at different paces. So. So you'll help with like physical therapy? Yeah, I'll go in, I'll help the physical therapist if a patient gets uh, transferred from the hospital to the rehab or I'll see the patient in the hospital. Sometimes they're having an elective surgery where they're deciding to amputate because they've had a ton of surgeries and they need to let the leg go. Sometimes it's traumatic, like a car accident, or sometimes it's vascular disease like diabetes or it's a cancer. Uh, mm -hmm. So everyone has different situations. So I kind of come in, um, let them know what their life could be in that it's not the end. It's actually just the beginning of a new chapter. That's awesome. How long have you been doing that? Been doing that professionally for 10 years. Wow. And uh, so I've been volunteering, though, technically for about 13 years. And uh, our good friend Celia, her dad, is one of the one people who got me into it when I was younger. Uh, oh, and, wow. uh, oh, wow. yeah, so I've been volunteering doing it for a really long time. That's awesome, man. Um, I mean, yeah, we got, we got the five-minute warning. Um, is there any, what's your message for the world? How about that? How yeah, do you go so, that direction? I mean, my message for the world is, uh, you know, I feel like that our minds are stronger than we think. I'm even realizing that myself. So as animals, because we are, we're human beings, but like a cheetah is fast, you know, elephants have long trunks and a porcupine has spikes and all of these things are given to them so that they can, you know, walk this earth and kind of protect themselves. I feel like us as human beings is our mind. 
and we we take it for granted it's under attack you know we have so many influences and distractions now and our mind is a, a tool that can be used you know for us and sometimes against us mm. so my message to the world is to protect your mind um, to try to keep it healthy and focus on you know whatever your goal is and if you believe it put it in your mind you can achieve it awesome amazing you have any uh future plans a Come ton on. of a ton of future plans. I have a lot of projects. I uh, got some few TV shows that I'm that I'm working on. Wow. Uh, but the biggest thing is triathlon. Trying not to get distracted. You know, I actually just got ranked 30th in the world, uh, fifth in the country, and you know, so I'm continuing to to kind of work. I go to Turkey in five weeks to compete again, and just trying to continue to keep working my way up the ranks and uh, get to either Paris 2024 for Paralympics or LA 2028. So. Just, you know, working on being the best triathlete I can be and uh, keep, uh, you know, kind of going against these Goliaths out there. What's after that? Decathlon? Is yeah. it, what's a decathlon? That's 10 events, right? Uh, yeah, the decathlon, yeah, that's different. But triathlon is the, the three sports. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there's like duathlon, which is like run, bike, run, you know, um, things things like that. But, yeah. yeah. What made you go, go towards try? So, yeah, when COVID hit, uh, my wife is a nurse. And, you know, at the height of pandemic was tough. She was, you know, in the hospitals. She worked at Good Sam, and she was out of the house. My kids were, I was homeschooling them, and I stopped playing sports, couldn't play team sports, couldn't play for Team USA soccer, and I needed to, I went through a depression, and I had to figure out how to reinvent myself, and a few of my friends were triathletes. It was something I've seen and something I wanted to do, and I like to do hard stuff for some reason, um, <laughs> right? I like to challenge myself, and I was like, this looks like it sucks, <laughs> you know, um, why not try it? And, uh, yeah, you know, I had some friends who were successful at you, it. You are who you hang out with. You yeah, know, like, yeah. I, I don't know any triathletes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, let's do it. We'll, we'll, get you, we'll get you on one. <laughs> yeah, we'll get maybe. you on one. That's it, Rizzo. I got you That's now. That's it. Maybe I'll right be there. on the other side. <laughs> That's it. No, no. Fighter heart. We're going to pull you in now. We're going to pull you in now. That's it. Thank you, Rob. I think that was great. Yeah. I think, Where uh, can they find you? Is there... Thank you, man. Yeah, robertanthony.speaker. Uh, you can Google Impossible, which is my organization. Uh, but, you know, just robertanthony.speaker or L Impossible. Google me. <laughs> awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you guys for what you're doing. Keep up the fighter heart spirit. Of course. Awesome. For sure, for sure. Thank you guys. Have a good one, everyone.